Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's six o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Ken Bradshaw, superintendent of the Richmond County School System. Welcome to our fourth public hearing to discuss the Richmond County School System Facility Master Plan. First, I would like to thank Principal Sproul and her team for hosting the meeting. Secondly, I would like to recognize our school board members who are present. Please stand or wave to be recognized. And will the Richmond County School System Central Office staff and principals and assistant principals and staff who are present, please stand to be recognized as well. Thank you so much. Audience, this is the time of the year when we review our portfolio of schools to see if we are maximizing program offerings and being fiscally responsible. I believe if we can do both, then student achievement can be accelerated. Therefore, we have partnered with an experienced educational facilities planner to assist us in achieving this goal. While working with our planner, we have learned a lot over the last few months, and actually, we've learned a lot over the past few days. The company is HPM, and our presenter is Mr. Tracy Richter. At the conclusion of this presentation, we hope you will be equipped with the same information we use before we make a final recommendation to the board. Mr. George Diaz from GSG will make a few remarks about how tonight's meeting will be organized. Mr. Diaz. Thank you, Dr. Bradshaw, and good evening. Uh, one of the first things I wanted to bring to your attention is if you look towards the back of the room, you'll see some signage that says human resources, special education, teaching and learning and transportation. That's in case you have any specific curriculum-based questions for the central office. Tonight, what we're going to focus on in this form and in this setting is on the proposed consolidation plan. Now, one thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is that Tonight, what you're going to be hearing is the overall plan, and you also will be hearing how this immediate proposal um, could affect this school, but the board will only vote on what's going to potentially happen for the 24-25 school year. So if you see something beyond that, the board will only receive it as information. You're probably wondering, when will the board vote on this? They will be voting on it March 19th at 6 p.m. And the last public meeting will be on March 12th over at the central office. Now, I'm going to read a little bit about uh, just some of the things, but I will share with you that what we do want to prioritize is parents who are being affected in this area first. After that, we will go to any general questions of any parent uh, or any community member that has not spoken at a previous public meeting. And then at that point, we will allow for anybody that has spoken before, if they would like to speak again at, that has spoken at a previous public meeting, we'll open up the floor at that point. Um, <clears throat> let me read this so we can get an understanding of what's about to happen. Prior to a local Board of Education's decision to consolidate any existing schools where the consolidation results in the students potentially being moved to another new or existing school, the Board of Education is required by law to hold public hearings and provide an opportunity for full discussion of the proposed plans. The plans that are being presented tonight are proposals only and are in draft form for the board to consider prior to any vote on the plan. The purpose of these public hearings is to provide the public an opportunity to learn more about the proposed projects, as well as for the public to provide feedback, comments, and concerns regarding the proposals so that the board members and school officials can consider these concerns prior to any vote on the plan. You will notice that there is also a court reporter present who will be preparing a transcript of all of the comments and concerns so that board members can review all of the information at the conclusion of the hearings and prior to any vote taken on the plans. The board members and school system personnel are here tonight to listen and receive feedback from the public. 
In order to receive as much feedback as possible within the allotted time, the board members or school system personnel will not be responding to comments during the meeting, but rather will be listening and receiving the points of discussion from the community. For any specific questions regarding logistics of the proposed plan, such as transportation routes and special education services, school system officials are here tonight and will be happy to help uh, we'll be happy to meet with you tonight after the conclusion of the meeting in order to receive those specific questions. The meeting is being live streamed, just as it's been live streamed since the inception of uh, these public meetings. You can live stream them at the county's website. You can also find the entirety of this meeting and every other public meeting that we've had at Next Era EDU on YouTube. Next Era EDU on YouTube. And you'll be able to watch this meeting in its entirety within the next 48 hours. With that being said, we are going to start with a video and then you'll hear from Tracy at HPM. This is our home, Richmond County. We know its history and we're invested in our future. These are the faces of tomorrow. Our kids deserve a chance to learn and grow in a community that cares. Our teachers are terrific. Our leaders work hard. And most importantly, our kids are filled with potential. Shouldn't we give them the best? But to do that, we must change. In the Georgia Milestones Assessment, Richmond County Schools ranked among the bottom 10 of the 180 public school systems in Georgia. Our aging buildings aren't able to keep up. Our children are not getting the education they deserve. Change is tough, but new beginnings make way for a better tomorrow, and that is worth it. In the past, we fell short, but we can do better, and we will. We can give our kids state-of-the-art buildings. We can offer them more teachers, staff, and programs, and the state of Georgia will pay for it. But first, we need to adopt a 10-year vision that brings more money into the district using state funds we currently don't qualify for. Here's how it works. Georgia requires a minimum number of students in schools in order to get funding. Today, many of our schools do not meet the minimum enrollment required to maximize state funding. That means instead of all of these resources, they get just this. That's what we can offer the majority of kids in our district now. It's not enough. Our kids are missing out on the things that are proven to help them get ahead. If we keep the status quo, we're leaving free money on the table. We get less than other districts. Plus, we're forcing kids to learn in buildings that aren't up to par. But look at this. Here's what we can offer if we are willing to make changes. We have to consolidate. Right now, we have too many buildings and not enough students. Before the next school year, here's what we need to do. Open New Richmond Hill Elementary to help families in an area where more kids are moving. Opening a new Bel Air Middle School will also balance out classrooms. Building a new Langford Middle School means moving students to Tut. This paves the way for faster construction. We need to close Spirit Creek Middle School. The same is true at A. Brian Mary Elementary School. The conditions in those buildings do not meet our students' needs. These recommendations came from the brightest minds in rebuilding school systems for tomorrow. HPM informed by a community task force. Together, we created a master plan. By evaluating existing facilities, tracing population trends, finding ways to get more state funding, preserving history while advancing technology and career opportunities. Now HPM is leading community conversations because we can't ensure the future of our children without your help. This isn't easy, but we're going to do things to decrease the impact on our kids. First, 
We're going to keep as many students together as possible. We're also keeping teachers and staff. Next, not only are we offering brand new buildings to many students, but this will allow others to get much needed upgrades. All throughout the process, we made sure buses will be there. And finally, we're preserving history. We're working with staff and alumni to make sure that's not lost as we work toward a better future. These changes are painful, but here are the facts. Studies tracked test scores, grades, and attendance. They all improve when kids move to fully funded schools with better facilities and more programs. Bigger schools don't mean bigger classes. In fact, it means more. More art, music, and the ability to learn languages and participate in sports. This isn't just happening in Richmond County. It's everywhere. Families are having fewer kids. Our schools were built for more kids than we have. Old buildings have high maintenance costs. According to the Government Accountability Office, 97% of U.S. schools need security updates. 87% are desperate for better technology. Aging buildings impact housing, too. Some neighborhoods which once served hundreds of kids will only have a handful. That's why 40% of our students don't stay in the neighborhood boundaries for high school. We need to adjust our school strategy to adapt to these changes. If not, our kids will only get left further behind. We can give our kids state-of-the-art buildings. We can offer them more teachers, staff, and programs. We can build a better foundation, offer world-class education, and ensure a better future. And the state of Georgia will help us pay for it. But first, we must change. Want to learn more about how this impacts your kids, your schools, and your neighborhood? Head to our website. There you can enter your address and see an interactive map showing the changes needed to ensure our kids keep up. This is just the first stepping stone to building a foundation for the future of a world-class education in Richmond County. Now we'll open up the meeting. First, we'll dive into the details about what this means for you. Then, we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Please prepare your questions and hand them to the moderator, who will give you further instructions. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me in the back okay? You all right? Okay, so um, tonight I'm going to walk you through... Um, what is going to be a, a vision of five years and a master plan that will eventually stretch out to 10 years and a master plan. Um, I will tell you, well, and first and foremost, I really, I really want to reach out and shout out to Josie High School girls and the, and the, and the West Side High School boys who represented the city so well in their state championships today. And so if you're listening, congratulations for being there. Y'all did great. Thanks for representing the Richmond County. So, um, okay, so let's get into this. So part of what we, um, when Dr. Bradshaw came and, and, and I met Dr. Bradshaw last summer and we talked about, you know, what districts have to do to realign their facilities to the enrollment trends that are happening. Um, and, he's, and he talked about the processes this district goes through to close schools. Um, and look, it's, it's not always easy to do that. And in the instance that we're in tonight, you know, we find ourselves actually in an opposite situation. And this hasn't been common all week. We've been talking to schools that we're talking about consolidating. But in the essence of how we have to look at our facilities, there always has to be reinvestment of our facilities and realignment of our facilities. And so what I'm going to take you through tonight is, this, is how the district got to where they are today. I'm going to walk you through the path of why we've put out what we've put out for a roadmap right now. But again, I want to make clear a couple of things, very, very clear, that what we're going to talk about in essence tonight is for the board meeting on March, um, on March 19th for the 24 and 25 school years, so for only this year. Anything after that is not, and nothing is final right now. The board will have to make decisions on what they want even for the 24-25 year, which will include opening new schools, those planning units that go into those schools, which will include a couple of consolidations. Um, and we'll also talk about a consolidation of a middle school that's going to go into a new middle school in a couple of years. 
So that's the only thing that, they're, that we are going to ask for them to vote on. Anything after that, the 25 and 26 year, is, is an ongoing community discussion. And it will continue to be an ongoing community discussion because it has to be. This district is past the days of doing one year planning. It just has to stop. So we have to look at five and 10 years out there to see what we could look like, what our demographics are saying, what our programs are saying, where our children are moving, what our children are needing. And so unless we have that vision, we can't even have that discussion and we wake up every August wondering, well, what school's gonna close this year? And we're kinda, we gotta be done with that. And so as we go into this conversation tonight, I want you to kind of, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of data to start. And I want you to be, and I'm going to assure you, because I've heard it all the way through the week. You're gonna hear about demographics, you're gonna hear about facilities, so you're gonna see numbers, you're gonna see numbers, you're gonna see some finance safe, you're gonna see that. It's all rooted to make sure that our children have more access to programs. So the conversation starts with the kids on how we get access to more programs for our kids and how it can be better funded and more maximized with the state dollars instead of local dollars. Now, but part of it has to be that kind of what we might call a business discussion because if you don't take care of business, you're not taking care of your kids. And so it's rooted in the children. And so that's the essence of this plan. But of course, you have to get there first. And so again, the rules say that we have to hold two public meetings. Well, we've held a lot more than two public meetings. And we're going to continue to hold more than <laughs> more meetings. And, and here's the thing, and this is what I want people to know out there, is that if you're not on the 24-25 list, you might not have gotten a scheduled meeting on there, but because and the only reason for that is that we needed to get to the March 12th and to the March 19th meeting. Everything beyond that, we are going to have continued conversations through the spring, summer, next fall, and as we continue this process, it's a continuous community engagement process of planning. And so you are going to get your time. And, but we, the immediate need was to make sure that the board could vote on what needs to happen next year in order to get the plan rolling. And so, um, so that's why we're out here. And um, when we're done, um, and again, I, I wanna keep reiterating who's back in the back. We've got human resources, we've got, ed, we've got teaching and learning, we've got special education, transportation. We even have the facilities guys here if you have question about the construction of the elementary school that's happening. Okay, so, because I know right now, it looks like, oh my gosh, I mean, it's March, what's going on over there? And we wanna open it in August. And so they'll answer questions. They've got some things up here to show you. Um, so those can have, ask specific questions like that. But in our, comments, in our comment time, I will answer any question that I'm able to answer for you, okay? So let's talk about demographics in the city and how the city has looked over the last 10 years. The baseline of any enrollment is how many kids are born in your, in your district or your county in this case, okay? And this is, what I wanna to get to the final point is this, is that declining enrollment is something that public education is dealing with all over the country. It's not just Richmond County. And most of the declining public school enrollment is due to demographic factors, not due to school factors, not due to reputation or performance or anything like that. The fact of the matter is, is that we're in a decline of birth rates that we haven't seen in a really long time. 10 years ago, there were about 2,935 births in this county, and even though the population rose 7,000, there's 400 less births, even though there's 7,000 more people. So we've got an inverse reaction of birth data to population data. Not only that, if you look to the right, the two largest classes right now in the Richmond Public Schools are your, your your juniors and seniors out there, actually your 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. If you go back, your senior class, 2007, was about the year they were born, there were 3,300, almost 3,400 births. That's almost 900 less now. And so, look, folks, when people aren't born, they don't show up to kindergarten. There's, that's no secret, that's, that's pretty good math, okay? And so, that's what the district's dealing with. They're dealing with the decline of enrollment. Not only that, we're also dealing with this idea that, and because I say it at every meeting, and although many of you heard this over and over, we just, we're not even kind of replenishing or gentrifying our children in our current homes. The neighborhoods are always gentrified. They always produce kids, and somehow it always happens. But what has happened is that as, we got, as we've gotten older, and we've gotten less birth that, and we've gotten less births, we also have this idea that people who just had, that are empty nesters now, simply aren't moving out of their houses yet. And, I'm, and I keep telling people, I'm a perfect example. My daughter's a sophomore in college now. 
Three years ago, I had two kids in high school. Now I don't have any. So the district doesn't get, I don't know, whatever they get, $19,000 for my two kids between them. And I'm not moving. My house is too big for just the two of us. It almost sounds cavernous sometimes. There's rooms I don't see. But I'm not moving because I'm, my, I've almost paid my house off. I've been there long enough at about a 2.5% interest rate that everybody was able to get. And I could move and get half the size of house for twice the price at 8%. Nobody's doing that. And so there's this pause in even movement of neighborhoods right now. That'll change eventually, because it will. That happens as we go through. But understand that there's a lot of things working against the demographics to get more kids in our buildings. And second of all, we don't have, we don't have really a pro-public education government right now either. And this is across the country, and it's everywhere. Capital cities and those governments are saying, more charter, more voucher. We've got to get our kids more choice because the public schools aren't working and they keep taking away and taking away. And so there's a lot of fight going on here and the people that sit in this room, because you sit in this room, you are public school people and we need to keep fighting for that. And so there's a lot of stuff working against us and we know that. And so that decline of enrollment that we see has been happening over time. And if you look at the top kind of line here, this is the number I most concern myself with, is that 10 years ago I had about, I had 2,670 kindergartens, uh, kindergartners in the district. This year's enrollment, the official enrollment, was 2,186. So about 500 less kids in kindergarten than there was just 10 years ago. Now, if you progress them through the district for the next 12 years, that 12 times 500 is 6,000. So 6,000 less kids, that's if we keep every kid. And so with the birth rates, the non gentrification you know, aging populations, less kids pushing out a bigger number at the bottom, it's going to be hard to maintain enrollment even still. And so the question is, is, well, how do you grow enrollment? Well, the question we need to ask is how you stem decline first. Get rid of decline and keep the kids that you have. And one of the ways that we talk about that is making sure that when every student walks in a building, they're getting, first of all, an equitable education to other schools, but they're getting the programs they need and they deserve. And so, but it's very difficult when the schools are so stretched thin because we have a lot of space out there that we have to stretch our resources thin. And we're spending our money trying to spread out these resources and we're spending our money keeping buildings open instead of putting our resources exactly where they need to be. And that's how you realign buildings. And so it's not always an easy process, but every district has to go through this. And so that's the kind of, that's what you're in. Now, the reason that I went, to, I came to Dr. Bradshaw and I said, look, I think you need a five and 10 year plan that way in five years, you really can know what your facilities look like. And in five years, we can stop this discussion around consolidation and really focus on continuous improvement of our facilities and programs. But at some point, you gotta get your house in order. And that's kind of how you do planning. And again, that's not, that is a lot of districts out there. It's not just Richmond County, but it, it's very difficult to go through these adjustments. As you see, we, one of the things we wanted to point out, and even though we're not talking about a high school tonight necessarily, you can see 25 or 30 years ago, the district was 97, about 9,700 high school kids. Now it's just under 8,600. 8, so let's say about 1,200 kids less. And what I'm concerned about is that because those numbers are so low in elementary school pushing through, that it's going to take about five or six years to lose another 1,000. It took you 25 years to lose 1,200. It's right now the way the numbers are passing through and the birth rates are happening. And even with the growth that you see, because there is some growth out there, there's apartments being built, but you saw the growth and it's still less. And so what I'm concerned about is that as I look at even, as I look at even looking at um, how students move in the district, you know, I'm always thinking about, well, how do, why do kids move and where do they move to? And so you can go online. We've got all kinds of reports on there and it's, it's very transparent in this. But one thing we wanted to look at is where do kids really go to school? Are they staying in their boundaries? Or are they not staying in their boundaries? Because one thing that we get in facilities plan all the time is, well, why don't you just move boundaries? Okay, it sounds simple enough. But if I go across, and, I, and this isn't really looking at anybody in particular, but I'll just go to, um, I'll just go to the first like, true middle school on there, which is Glen Hills Middle School, and only just because it's the top up there. If you look across, the way you read this chart is if you look all the way across, you can see there's a column about five in that says live in. So what that tells me, there's 998 middle school kids that actually live in the middle school boundary for Glen Hills. When I look over, I see that 340 of those kids leave their boundary to go somewhere else. 
So 34% of kids leave their boundary to go find another middle school. Now, the same thing is happening at the high school level too. And what's concerning is that, and, and again, one of the things I know and I, and I can appreciate is this talk of legacy and tradition and how much it means in our high schools. And the problem is, is when I start to see some high schools at 40% transition rate out of their own boundary, I'm wondering how much legacy and tradition mean to those kids when they're chasing programs, they're not even staying at their home schools. And so it becomes, a, it becomes a discussion is that if we want to keep the legacy and tradition, we need to make sure that we're supporting the schools and having the numbers in the schools to keep them. And that becomes more and more difficult as we keep spreading thin and we get less and less kids and keep the same amount of buildings. And so that's why we track students like this. The numbers don't mean a lot. I don't put a judgment on the number at all because you don't put judgment on numbers. What it is is to help you kind of see what's going on and why, why it's happening. And then try to figure out then how you can realign your program so this doesn't happen as much. Obviously, kids staying in neighborhood schools and having magnet schools in the district, it's very important. Having magnet choice is very important. Having choice schools are very important. But neighborhood schools are just as important. And so we've got to support that neighborhood structure along with the magnet structure. And folks, it's not a competition. It's all working as one community, one village to get to, to, get to one school district that works. And so it's what becomes difficult in planning, obviously, is that when you're coming from your school, and many of you are coming to represent your school, as you should, that I don't have the luxury of just saying, we're just going to look at this school and plan it. Because then I've got to go to the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. And if you do it in a single silo and individually, then you can never put a complete plan together for the district for 28,000 kids. And that's the goal. So if I look at the projected enrollment, and like I told you, this is what starts to concern me. If you look at that bottom line of 912, right now about 8,400 kids total. If I look out in that 28, 29, and 29, 30 school year, I'm somewhere between that 77 and 7,400. Let's just call it 7,500. That's another 1,000 kids out of high schools. So with the projected enrollment being that, right now you have 12,150 high school seats. Right now the projection is 7,500 kids and I don't know how to get more in there because they're not there to push in. That means there's 4,500 empty high school seats in the district in five years. Your biggest, high, your biggest high school right now is about 1,300. That means three and a half empty high schools of your eight that you pay for, by the way. They're your buildings. You keep the lights on, you keep them cool, you keep the yards mowed, you keep all that done. And thank you taxpayers, I guess. But that doesn't seem like it's a useful use of our dollars when it could be going to programs and not facilities. And so the argument isn't necessarily that, that it should be, that it's all doom and gloom. And actually it presents opportunity because you have so much space in there to realign the programs where you need them. It provides us some opportunity, even though there's some pain points along the way. And so as you look at the funding analysis, I always, I always point to this triangle because I, I think it's really important. And I've used this for a lot of years because I think this is what districts deal with all over the country. Every district wants the best and most programs they can get. But every district wants to be able to operate it and afford those. But it also, communities want to keep their schools at reasonable sizes so they're not so big that they don't recognize their kids. Now, the problem here is that when you walk through a triangle like this, it's hard to get all three. And let me explain that. If I, have, if I want the most programs I can get for my kids and I want small school sizes, I'm going to have to spend a lot of money. And it's more local money than state money. It's on you to do that. And look, if you're willing to support that, great. It's your community. Or if I want diverse programs and low operating costs, I can't keep the smallest size schools. And then if I go just one more way, if I go to low operating costs and small school sizes, I likely can't have robust programs. And so the trick to any of planning is that what does your triangle look like for Richmond County? And it's your triangle. It's not Columbia County. It's not APS. It's not Savannah Chatham. It's Richmond County because everybody's triangle is different. And that's what makes you unique. Right now, the way this district is set up, and it's not on you, it's not necessarily on this administration or not necessarily on this board, but right now this district is set up to have smaller schools, low programs, high cost. That's not a formula that's sustainable. And so a facility plan has to help shape that a little bit. 
but it only can do so much. A facility plan can't hire a principal, can't hire good teachers, can't hire guidance counselors, can't do any of that stuff. We can position the buildings and we can have great buildings to attract good teachers to. This is a real, pretty nice building to teach in right here, obviously. But this is the kind of environment that we want to attract good teachers and to maintain good teachers. We've got great teachers in this district, and I've met them this week, and they, they're pretty vocal, by the way. And, I, and they're awesome. And they are awesome. They're fighting for the kids. And it's hard to fight for kids when you don't have resources to support you. And so this is what we want to get to on this, too. Now, in the state, when we talk about maximizing state funding, this is what we talk about. Now, again, this isn't about dollars, and this isn't about cost savings. There's no savings in this necessarily because we're not saving dollars. We just need to maximize our dollars. We're not going to save dollars and stick it in a bank somewhere. We're going to respend it somewhere else. I'd just rather direct it to kids and programs and buildings. But if we look at the state of Georgia and they say that the minimum funding for a high school, and I'm going to show you what minimum funding means in a minute, and a spoiler alert, it ain't a lot. You have to have 970 kids in a high school. Or if you want a fully funded program, it takes almost 1,700 kids. Well, the fact of the matter is, is Richmond County is not going to have 1,700 student station high schools. Those are too big for Richmond County. And I've been saying it all along. Let the Gwinnetts, the Cobbs, the Fulton, let them build the 2,500s. It's not for you. But let's get our high schools to an 11, 12, 1,300 where they have robust programs. And not just, look, I'm not just talking about art, and I'm not just talking about music. I'm talking about AP courses. I'm talking about athletics and bands and, you know, the full liberal arts education. That's what those 12 or 1300 student station schools get you. And let me put any myth to, to, to rest here is that school size has no correlation to class size and don't think it does. I will show you schools in this country that have 25, that are built for 2,500 that have 20 in every classroom. And I'll show you schools that have 250 that have 35 in a classroom. There's no correlation. It The correlation is, do you have enough students in there to get enough staff in there to keep your class size down? Because ironically, those smaller school buildings can't get enough funding in their school buildings to get all the resources to keep the class size down. And so class sizes rise. Now, I'm not going to say that the facilities plan levels that. There's always going to be a ninth grade English class that has 35 kids in it because every kid has to take ninth grade English and you only have so many ninth grade teachers to teach English. And then the next period in the next classroom, you've got AP calculus and it only has 12 in it. But it balances itself out and you manage a building the right way. The intent of a building is to build a capacity that says you can only have this many kids in a classroom and this is your maximum capacity. And then you start to do the evaluation of how many schools you need, how many classrooms you need in order to align the right way in your programs. At the middle school level, the, the goal is 640 um, to get minimum funding, but you want to get to 750 to get more of that full funding. At the elementary school, at minimum funding is 450. And again, I'm going to show you what this means in a minute. But if you look at the district as a whole, 16 of the 28 elementaries are currently below 450, which means 16 of the 28 can't get full funding in their buildings. Six of eight middle schools. Oh, I know, that's a punch in the gut. A little secret. I taught middle school education for seven years before I started doing this 25 years ago. I have, a, I have a something in my soul for middle grades education, and your kids aren't getting the middle school like experience they need for exploratory courses to introduce them to the pathways in high school that they want to do. I'm telling you, that one, that one is kind of my mission too. I, I want to fix this. At the elementary, at the high school, four of the eight high schools can't even get to minimum funding with the enrollment they have in there. And so, again, it's, it's not an easy conversation to have, but at the, at the elementary grade level, if you're at 450, you do get the principal, the half principal, the half nurse, the guidance, or the, I'm sorry, those are shaded out. The principal, the guidance, the media specialist, and art teacher. And then you have to only pick one of the three for liberal arts, which means you actually pay locally for a PE teacher and a, and a music teacher or an art teacher, or one of the three, or the two of the three. And you know what? Sometimes that's okay. The communities are willing to pay for that because the state will never get you to there. There's not, the dollars just doesn't, the state doesn't give you enough dollars to get there. But if I start, if I go below, look what happens. If I go below 450, I get a principal. I'm sorry, the, the light blue, you do get that half principal in that one, that light blue. When I gray it out, that's what you get under 450 a principal and a half nurse. And you pay for the rest. And again, your communities are willing to support this to some level. 
but wouldn't we want the state to maximize the dollars more in our classrooms? Of course we would, okay? And so part of that is, is that this is program driven. This isn't money driven. This is kid driven right here in this. If I go to the middle schools and the minimum, remember that 640 number, that minimum number gets you a principal, an assistant principal, a nurse, a guidance, an art teacher, band teacher, two PE teachers, and a media specialist. After that, it gets scarce. The exploratory vision goes away for middle schools. Good you're focused on the core, like that, but we're not even getting to the minimum. And so it's likely less than this unless we're paying for it locally. And then finally, but if I get to 750, look what I get. I get more CTE, but, if I, if, but that's fine. That's Georgia state dollars. Now local dollars can go to more exploratory. And so that's the goal. It's a small rudder, but we'll get there if we can get, if we can get the plan in order for middle schools. And then finally at the high schools, this one's disturbing. 970 the minimum, okay? Four of your eight are not there. That means this. One principal, two APs, two guidance, one nurse, got a media specialist, two PE teachers, which means less coaches, art, art teacher, band teacher, no choir, no advanced world languages, and look at my CTE programs. That's just, I'm telling you, for me, and, I, and I've been doing this all week, and this is still, this still just gets to me a little bit, that I just think kids deserve more than that. I just do. It's in my, it's in my core as an educator. As I look at teachers, it's in the core of you as educators. And you know what this also means, and I just show this baseline. I'm not talking about academic coaches, special education teachers, those paraprofessionals, all of that make your schools work. I'm not even talking about the custodial staff that make your schools work. That's where it starts to cut really deep because this is the core mission of what we do and we can't afford the people to support the core mission of what we do because we're just stretched too thin. That's full funding. Now again, I don't suggest we get all the way to 1680, but we can get close and we can. And that's the goal to try to get to. And so as I go through this, what I want to talk about now is the recommendations for next year. These are the only thing that we're asking the board to take action on. Now keep in mind, this is up to the board to take action on. All we can do is set the first year of recommendations. Now, in this case, what we're going to look at for the 24-25 year is that, there you are, Richmond Hill. There you go, your new elementary school right there. Um, the Richmond Hill K-8 that we're in will convert to the middle school building. Um, we've got some NPUs that I'm going to show you which kind of areas come into these buildings and I'm going to show you how you can find your address to get there tonight. Um, and then, um, then we also have a new Bel Air Middle School opening which is currently a K-8. Their K-8 is going to go to an elementary school Why they go to a middle school so it's the opposite of you guys. And then we've got a Tut-Langford combination um, and what this means here for Tut-Langford is that we looked at the, we looked at, there's going to be a new middle school on the Langford site, brand new middle school. It's been kind of in the books or thought about for 20 or 25 years. So it's about time this area got a brand new building for middle grades education. What's going to happen though, in order to shorten the timeline for construction, what we want to do is we want to move the current Langford population into the Tut building and they'll fit in what we, what we know. And we got, there's a lot of logistics to work through with, with faculty and all that stuff. Um, and it's a new boundary too, because we're already moving some elementary schools out. So there's neighborhoods that you might not think go together that aren't, aren't together, because we've already started to move. In the Bel Air move, we've moved all of Copeland's elementary boundary out into the Bel Air. They're not going to Tut Langford anymore. So kind of if you, if you look at the southwest part of that Tut or that Langford boundary, they're heading over now to the Bel Air. And so it'll only be basically Montesano's boundary from Langford that will feed out of that area, basically. There's a couple little pieces of Lake Forest Hills. But so that kind of minimizes some disruption in neighborhood too. And we, and we understand that. But in that combination though, we can, we can get t Langford's, the, the building at Langford, and that's what we're just gonna call it, the building at the Langford site. We could be, a, we'll just call it Tut Langford right now. Um, we can cut a year off construction, save millions of dollars, and get a middle school built in two years. And that's what we want to do. We want to get that middle school built. Now, if the board decides that we shouldn't move that population over in one year, 
the simple decision then is if the SPLOS passed, because you need that SPLOS to pass to get the last funding of that building, then we just, it's going to take three years because you got to stage it. you got kids on campus, so you got to protect the kids while you're tearing down a building and tearing down a building. And so that's what that means if we can't combine the schools this year. So there's a, that's plan B if the board says, I don't think we should combine this year. Okay. It just means another couple years and a couple more million dollars. Okay. That's not our decision if, if we don't think we can do that. The next moves are at Spirit Creek and at Mary. Um, these are closures uh, for next year. In, um, from the Spirit Creek perspective, um, moving into um, Hepzibah and Pine Hill, and again, some NPUs in there that we'll show on here, and then also closing Mary, which is a little complicated in it's going actually out to three schools. A little more difficult, not ideal, certainly, um, into elementary schools now that we'll get to the full funding number, which we're pretty excited about. So this is kind of, this is how maps will look. This is Bel Air, and I'm not going to go through Bel Air because I want to get to you guys. Um, that, and there's a Tut Langford, so you can see that Tut Langford looks completely different than the current Langford and Tut boundaries do um, as they go forward. This is the closing of Spirit Creek, and you can see, like in here, you see those blue numbers in there? Those are those planning units we talk about. Planning units are basically neighborhoods that are grouped together. Um, as to not split neighborhoods, where we, you know, because we don't try to split neighborhoods, we try to keep entire neighborhoods together. Um, so as you go through there, that shows kind of that Spirit Creek in there. This is also the Mary. Again, a little more complicated because part of, the, part of that student population will go to Lake Forest Hills, which means they have exposure to IB programs at Lake Forest Hills. Um, Title I dollars will increase 60 or 70,000 more dollars because of that move. That's a great move for Lake Forest Hills and the students from Mary that will go there. You see a small section in the in the north the northwest part going to Warren Road. Transportation is cut dramatically for those kids because they're much closer to that building. And then the move of the northern part gets them to Garrett, which puts Garrett closer to being a fully funded elementary school. And so uh, Mary is kind of stepping up of those four schools to kind of make sure that every other school keeps that funding. And that kind of what happens in this. And so what I do want to explain in a consolidation that the, the secret isn't that we're just in a room and we pick one school and then we figure out how to do it. We look at an entire region, we look at an area and we say, okay, let's look at the student population, look at the, let's look at the facility condition, let's look at the staffing, let's look at the programs, let's look at all of that and how do you mix that together and what schools kind of come together to rise up to the top to stay or schools that we should consider. So it wasn't like we sat in a room and said, it's got to be Mary. That's not even close to how we do this work. There's a lot of consideration when it comes to staffing, student movement, um, programs, all of those things. And so eventually just one has to come out, but it gets the other three schools to where they need to be to have full funding for those programs, which means those kids that are leaving Mary are going into fully funded programs. And so, um, but nonetheless, hard for that Mary community. Now, let's look at you all. Uh, New Richmond Hill Elementary School. So what we have here, and what I want to do is I want to explain this chart up here. Um, what you see is the, what you see is kind of that enrollment, uh, that capacity that's current, so the capacity of the building. Now, how we figure capacity. At the elementary grade level, we don't count capacity for art rooms, music rooms, um, and gymnasiums. And the reason we don't count capacity in those spaces is because when a student leaves their homeroom, Nobody fills in their homeroom behind them. If they go to gym, nobody's filling in their room, so we can't give them both capacity, okay? But what we also figured, and I know this sounds, your, your teachers are going to roll your eyes and laugh a little bit, we figured your capacities for elementary schools at 20 and a half. Now, the reason we did that was to allow classrooms to stay open for resources, for coaches, for those. And so when you get to a certain number, the state does allocate for resource teachers and resource space. And so your capacity actually, even though your class size, maybe in your teacher contract says 24 or 25, we figure a classroom to be 20.5, and that gets you your capacity. And so you have room in buildings to fluctuate back and forth is what I'm telling you. There's plenty of room in these buildings. Now the new capacity figured for 1,000 students at the Richmond Hill, and you can see it's built not to be 1,000, it's built like so you have smaller learning communities in that building. Um, now you can see though, when we make this planned unit development move, this, this, these planned units, when we make that move, you see that we've got Richmond Hill a little higher than its capacity. Now, 
Remember that chart I showed you about kids leaving boundaries? Kids leave these boundaries. They're going to magnet schools, they're going to other program schools that they want to go to. We know this school will not open at 1,000 kids. We also know that there's some what we call invisible kids that will show up. That, where'd you come from? Well, I saw a new school, I decided to come here. And that's great too, we'll take all we can get. But keep in mind, we got plenty of room in this school. Even if 1,000 showed up, we'd still have extra rooms because capacity is figured like that. And so we want to be sure that we're opening buildings appropriately. The worst thing to do is open a building and put a portable on it. We don't think that's going to happen here because we know that kids will go to magnets, they'll go to other boundary schools to follow parents. Look, parents choose other schools sometimes because it's more convenient for work or their mom or dad teaches at a school and they just go to that school with them. That's always going to happen for us, okay? So that's why I'm not worried about that number. But what I want to show you is some of these areas. So like Jamestown Elementary School will go into this Richmond school from those NPUs, um, from NPU 20 and 21, and then from Wheelis Road, 34E, so you can see from the top, Wheelis Road comes down. Now this has a bigger impact, by the way. This has a high school impact to feeder patterns because of this switch in. Now the other thing is, is that Richmond Hill, if you go here right now as an elementary student, this is your boundary. You go right over. Staff, if you're an elementary teacher, you move right over as a staff. Okay, so the intent is to move you as an entire group over. Now, how that works is why HR is back there. So if, if you have any questions about how that does work as a teacher, Go back there and talk to HR. They've got, and then, so what will happen is that as, a, as you finish out the spring, they'll come and meet with you as a team, meet with you individually, um, and how that transition will happen over. Likely you have some things in your rooms that you wanna move. Well, the district should probably help you move those things too. So you need a movement plan. So you're gonna have to do all that this spring and summer to make sure that organization, so when you show up to your classroom, everything that you have in your current classroom is over there. So it's an exciting time for an elementary school and um, state-of-the-art stuff that you're going to get. Now, the other impact of this is that you see that, for instance, this Jamestown, these Jamestown um, planning units, those right now are in actually the Glen Hills feeder pattern. Those students now will move into the Butler feeder pattern from, the, the, from those two Jamestown roads. So they will come out of that Glen Hills because that's their current geography feeder pattern. So it does, so we're paying attention to then what that means at the middle school and the high school numbers, which helps that Butler High School number to maintain that 11 or 1200 for closer to fully funded. So the Richmond Hill Middle School it looks a little more complicated, but it really isn't. And so I want to be and so pretty clear here. Those NPUs, again, from, um, from the Glen Hills that come out of Jamestown, okay, they are Glen Hills Middle School, but there's that Jamestown NPUs. That makes sense? That, so. They, they're Jamestown, now they're middle school kids who went to Glen Hills. Now they're gonna go to Richmond Hill Middle School from those two NPUs. And then also um, you see that, I'm sorry, from Tobacco Road, NPU 215, Pepperidge will move to Richmond Hill Middle School. And then there's a Spirit Creek kind of um, closure in here that impacts some of the students that'll come over too just because of those planning units that are coming over. And then you can see, obviously, that right now, with those NPUs, there are 80 9 through 12 students in those current NPUs that would be moving into the Butler feeder instead of the Glen Hills. So the nice part is, is that we can track student movement a lot better now. We're tracking that student enrollment to make sure we're maintaining good feeder patterns and programmatic feeder patterns. And so here's the thing is that Although from a map like here, it's hard to see like, where's my road there? Well, first of all, there's maps here, but the good news is we also have it electronically for you. So I've got somebody in the back. Do I have somebody in the back to help me out? On the district website, if you go to the Richmond Hill, uh, Richmond County website, there is a, in the planning section, there, and you can see clearly where the planning section is because it's pretty prevalent right now. There's a tab on there that says, um, they're gonna pull it up for you. Maybe, okay, there we go. Okay, so you see on the district website, it's you know, rcboe.org slash planning. If you go to the bottom, down the bottom, you can see that there's a tab that says 
2425 proposed school zone locator. Okay, you push that button, and on the top left of that, you can see where that search glass is. You can type your address in. And they're just going to make up an address that's close to here. And it got says, so what it does is it actually points to that property. It shows you what NPU you're in. And then on the left-hand side, you can see where your current elementary is and where your proposed assignment will be. Okay, so if you're in one of those areas that, if you're in one of those MPUs where you think you might be in that MPU, just type in your address. It'll show you exactly where your next year school will be, where your feeder pattern for middle school and high school will be. And so we've provided that tool for you also. We'll keep pushing that at, well, we keep pushing this out for you too so you know where it's at. There are plenty of maps available and this, these maps are online too if you want to just zoom into them. So we're trying to make this as, as communicative as possible because we know these movements are sometimes complicated to understand and you don't know exactly where you are in the move. And once again, if even, after, even at the end of the night, if you want to come up and you want to get on the tool, we'll get on the tool with you to do your address so you can see before you leave. Okay, thanks for that in the back. Okay, so that basically gets us through, go ahead, um, to this recommendation. Okay, so that is all we're asking the board to vote on on the 19th, those things that I just showed you. After this is just a vision, is a roadmap that is, in, that is going to demand a ton of conversation. And when I say a ton of conversation, a ton of conversation has to happen because no decisions are made on this. The board doesn't have a scheduled vote on any of this. So next year, we still anticipate the closure of a couple more elementary schools. Jenkins White happens to be one because the city is, um, is demolishing some subsidized housing in that area. And that boundary is literally going to have 100 or 150 kids in it by the end of next year, unfortunately. And so there's going to be even no kids to support that. And so part of school planning is reaction to city plans and county commissioner's plans and those two, and we got to adjust to those. So there will be, and, but we're not going to, we haven't decided how those MPUs will work because we're not sure where those kids will exactly land until next year. So we want to see where that student enrollment lands so then we can start doing good planning with those students very early in the school year. So we're making sure we're taking care of them. And then also in the Gracewood, it's going to take some movement also. Schools out in the southeast part of this county, or south, yeah, southeast part of this county, where we see shrinking enrollment in the rural areas. Um, how do you get kids closer to buildings there? And so there's some work to do on those NPUs out there. And again, we've just identified them. The other night we had a great contingency of Gracewood um, teachers that came out um, that started the conversation and asked some really good questions about what happens if we don't shrink. Well, the good news is we well, still have a school. And so that's why we put a five-year plan out there, at least to start a roadmap of conversation. It's not to put out any sort of panic waves, but the panic waves are when you just find out a week before. Like, we've got a year to think about this and really to plan it well for that area. Now, the bigger moves start in this bottom line, in these bottom two sections right here, which really start to talk about high school alignment. And high school and alignment, now, talking about elementary schools, I get it. Middle schools, I get it. High schools is a big, big discussion. You know, tradition, legacy, all that, I get it. And so, but part of this requires an, an, an effort to, in a singular perspective, I've been saying this a lot, that first of all, and I will say this 10 more times so I know it's clear, the magnet programs aren't going away. They stay. The choice programs stay. They're going to stay. There's always going to be that. And so there's no danger of the programs disappearing. But in an effort to get to a facilities move in order to keep as many high schools as we can, the idea of and, and I've shared this all along, and, and I'll keep saying it. When I first walked into this district and I went to my first meeting with community members, all I heard was, we already know you're going to close Laney and Josie. Why are you even here? That's what I kept hearing. And I kept looking at them and going, I don't even know that. How do you know that? Because I don't have any data in front of me to show me that that's even possible to do. And so, but we know we have to reduce operationally high schools in this district. And so after we got all this data collected, after we went out, we, we sent a survey out in December that you saw to ask about how to make decisions. We went through what we called an options work session where we worked through all kinds of different scenarios about how we maximize the number of high schools that we have so we don't have to close high schools. 
but how do we reduce the number of seats and how we get the programs to get our high schools to the number they need to get to. And I will tell you, and this is the honest truth, when we came in, we, we had a first kind of draft at this because we have to start somewhere. And we walked in with keeping your magnet schools and then five high schools. That was our first proposal to close three. That was our first kind of option to throw on the wall. And I'm gonna tell you, the look on the face of the staff members were like, you're crazy and you're gonna get run out of town. I'm like, you're probably right. We can't close three high schools here, so let's not close three high schools. But in order to do that, you have to align your programs differently. In order to do that, you have to look at your magnet programs. You have to see how they're housed in facilities. And this is where it becomes difficult because there are some logistics things and none of this is final, but this is the first start of a conversation. And we've also had other conversations this week as a leadership team and a facilities team based on our community conversations already. So it's ongoing. And we're gonna go out and meet with those communities starting in the spring, work in the summer, next fall too. None of this is ready to go. It's just the roadmap to get us there. A move of A.R. Johnson out to the RCTCM campus and the, and the reason to do that is the goal would be to get the Murphy Middle School and Hornsby Middle School into that A.R. Johnson building as a middle school. Now, the logic behind that was this, that they are literally across the school from a high school, that in order to get more resources back and forth, AP teachers for math and sciences, um, art teachers, music teachers, coaches that can share back and forth, they would literally be on the same campus so you could maximize resources with the teachers that you have at those buildings. Improving middle grades education right adjacent to a high school and having a collective kind of vision for that laney feeder pattern. The idea was to try to bolster that. And now, that would require that A.R. Johnson to move. The problem with that is that A.R. Johnson is very much tied to the medical community there too. And so there is that at odds. With a, with a plan in order to bolster a neighborhood middle school and high school to keep a high school viable. That was kind of what we looked at, but we know that it has these other issues that are, that are associated with it. The other piece of that then is if you look down on that list is that we would move then where the current, because Murphy and Josie are on the same side, I don't know if you know that. We would move the Josie kids into that Murphy building which has recently had a lot of work done to it they would fit in there, they've got science labs, they got all that, and do selective demolition of the current Josie High School, and then build state-of-the-art career and technical lab space to promote career pathways in a comprehensive high school. So Josie would still remain a comprehensive high school, but it would have a focus also on high-end and practical technical skills for students to run through pathways. Sure, we want medical pathways, but we also still need electrical pathways and we still need culinary arts pathways. We need entrepreneurship. We need those great programs that kids need to, to succeed. Now, but here's the other thing, is that Josie would no longer be a boundary school. Or what it would do is we would take the Josie current feeder patterns and we would move them into the Laney feeder patterns. Josie's boundary would always remain though. We would never get rid of Josie's boundary. So any child that lives in the Josie boundary will always have Josie High School as their neighborhood high school. It's a comprehensive high school still. If they chose not to go a career path, they could still get a comprehensive high school education there. So they still have their neighborhood high school. It would take, we estimate, about a $30 million investment into Josie. So, we kept Josie as a neighborhood school, it's a choice school, and we kept Laney High School with a stronger feeder pattern. Now, that means we're operationally less one. If we, now the plan was, and again, it's, it's, it's very tentative at this point, then you just leave ARJ out at the RCTCM building. And then you look at those programs and you say, okay, what's gonna move into the Josie program and what's gonna remain at ARJ? And ARJ is still the magnet school. It is still the magnet school. It's still that medical pathway. And so, so it's a, but they have more capacity there. We'd have to adapt some space to it, invest some dollars into some space, which is already a pretty good building. It's already a high-tech building. And then we then look at, and so then we're down a complete high school because RCTCM is one high school off, but it's a programmatic high school, but it's still an operational high school. Now the next, the real hard discussion then comes in the Glen Hills community. That the idea then is to take, reinvest into the elementary middle grades education there which means Meadowbrook would close and Meadowbrook and Jamestown would combine kind of 
We would move the, there's NPUs to balance enrollment, but the initial move would be into the Morgan Road building, and then we would then take down Jamestown Elementary. But we would only modify Morgantown for a short time, because in the next SPLOS program, five years down the road, we want to build a brand new Jamestown Elementary on that site. So they would have a brand new elementary there. And then we would move the Glen Hills Elementary School to the middle school campus, which means, again, modifications to that building for bathrooms, for science. But think about this. Middle school, elementary kids are going to go onto a building that has a full competition gym, theater, science labs. They're going to get this resource-rich building by, if they move there, which means then Glen Hills Elementary can come offline. But we still have Glen Hills Elementary. But in order to do that, we would have to move the Glen Hills Middle School to the high school campus, which, again, as you can then predict, a five-year vision would be that would phase out Glen Hills in five years. That's a hard, hard discussion to have. But I can have 12,150 seats with 7,500 kids, and I can spend it on buildings. And look, if you guys want to continue to do that, that will be the plan moving forward but your programs will still be spread thin. And it's a tough decision. And we're going to walk in the Glen Hills community, and they're going to say, well, why wasn't it Butler? And then I'll go to Butler, and the Butler will say, well, why wasn't it Cross Creek? And I'll walk into Cross Creek, and they'll say, why wasn't it Hesbeth? And then they'll go, why wasn't it Westside? It'll always be a circular argument. And so, again, it wasn't that it was Glen Hills High School. It wasn't that at all. It was a whole combination of how to move the district and do a programmatic alignment that all students have more access to more programs. Right now, one of your high schools only has two AP courses. Only two. So folks, it's not just about art and music and football. It's about true access to state-of-the-art programs and successful programs. So the Glen Hills discussion is a long-term discussion. And look, in five years, if they just go gangbuster and they say we're going to get kids back and they fight for the kids and they get them back and enrollment goes up we got we got time to think about it we got time to pivot that's the reason you put a five-year plan together but i will tell you that there's a lot of districts out there that said if they need to get rid of three high schools guess what they're going to do next year they're just going to close three high schools but that is no way to treat a community and so we've got to figure this one out this is where all that comes into play and it's a very difficult discussion but it at least sets a roadmap to start, and it starts a community conversation long before action takes place. Oh, I think I was done anyway. Okay, so that's just an explanation of it. Um, that's, a, again, a map of it. If you want to go online and look at it, I just explained all of this to you and that. You can look at that. We're in our, um, in our second, well, we've got two more meetings after this. We do have a six o'clock at Bel Air to have the same discussion. There is a three o'clock on, on Tuesday at the central office to give an overview of this one more time. The advertisement says that we're gonna present this kind of, we're gonna present this again. Now, people are gonna say, well, why three o'clock? Well, we've been offering at six o'clock all the time. There's people who can't make six o'clock, but before they go to a second shift or third shift, may be able to come to a three o'clock and we'd like to welcome them too. So we're trying to offer some different times, some different opportunities, some different venues, and we're trying to get this message out as much as we can. So with that, first and foremost, I want to thank you for the grace of listening to that. There was a lot of information there, and some of you have heard it about five or six times now and probably can come up here and do it for me. No, not that you'd want to. Um, but I appreciate that, and I appreciate you coming out. But now what we're going to do is George is going to give you some instructions about... How to answer, how to ask questions. Again, my, um, my response to you, if you have a question for me, if I can answer it, I'm here to answer it. Right in front of everybody so your question gets answered before you leave. If you do have an operational question, you've got everybody in the back to help you. If you've got, for instance, you've got special needs, if you've got um, other specialized programs, teaching and learning is back there too to help you. Um, so you've got resources back there on top of you can make comments and questions here. George, I'll turn it over to you. So what we'll do is this seems like an intimate group. So we're just going to go ahead and open it up. Uh, anybody that would like to go ahead and come and ask their first question, there is a comment card that you will fill out. Um, you'll walk up to this mic. Please state your name 
for the court reporter, and we'll get right to it, whether it's regarding this school or any of the things that you heard this evening. Uh, we're game to hear it all. We've been at these meetings up until 9.30 at some of them, so uh, we'll be here to listen to any questions. Any folks want to start coming up? Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Do me a favor. If you'll... Yeah, if, and if you'll use this mic right here, make sure you state your name for the uh, record. My name is Jessica. Georgia's ratio from childcare up until high school is not the best. Okay. So with combining these schools the way they are, what are you assuming ratio for these teachers? Because we see now where Teachers are one to 20 kids, one to 30 kids. What are your expectations for not only the teachers, but for the students as well? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the expectation is that if, okay, it's cutting out. I want to make sure you hear this and everybody hears this. So the expectation is, is if you can get those buildings to those fully funded numbers, that you have enough teachers to stabilize the class sizes so they don't fluctuate all the time. Now. The only problem with that, and, I, and I, I will tell people all the time, you can't guarantee it because what will happen is that you're going to have a third grade class that's going to have 18 or 20 more kids in it, and you have to spread them across four teachers. And so you might get two or three more in that third grade class, but the next year you get back to normal. But the concept is, is that if you can get those buildings to at least those minimum fundings, you can stabilize the class sizes because you have enough teachers in the building to stabilize the class size. Now. The problem is, is it's going to take, it's a small turn, okay? We've got to get the buildings to where they need to get to. And so it may take a couple years to stabilize, but you're exactly right. We need to get those class sizes to a manageable class size for these teachers. We need to get them paraprofessionals, other coaches in the classroom to minimize the management in the classroom too. One, one of the great things about, for instance, in the Mary thing of if we can talk about anything good in that process is that those schools will get more Title I dollars in their buildings, which means more teachers and resources. And when a Title I teacher comes in, they're not just teaching Title I kids, they take care of all kids. So that helps minimize kind of the management of kids too. So it takes a minute to get there. When our facilities get to that higher number, you get the resources to level it. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. But I'm, we're completely with you. It's ridiculous to have so much high of class size. We don't need that anymore. Just give us a minute to get there with the facilities to get them right, and they will get right when the facilities get right. Great question. Thank you so much. Good night. Rachel Rouse. Hi, Rachel. Hey. Um, what's going to happen with the students at Tubman? How does the long-term plan affect them? So at Tubman with the CT Walker, okay, so there are specialized programs for those individual students. Um, we do have some available space, and one of the things is, is that we have to come to some conclusion, but there would be a plan to move those programs to appropriate spaces. They wouldn't be combined. We would move them again to an individual building that we could use, um, mostly to maximize the building for students, more students. So there are programs that do have to be relocated in that. And we have to have a little further discussion if CT Walker will even happen. But there is a plan that there are other buildings out there to manage that. So um, if CT Walker moves into Tubman, the students currently at Tubman will be moved to other places? Yeah, and, that's, and, and so, you know, as those students, as, that, as those programs work, those students come in, and the, the, the goal is to get them back out into the, into the school system mm -hmm. in that case. And so that's kind of a, a population that doesn't stay every year. And so with the... And this happens in programs like this a lot, that they get moved for other schools to come into them. Or, and so we do really have to pay attention to that and pay close attention to that because we do have students that have that need. I was in that building today, and I see really great things happening on that one-on-one. -on -one. Most of the classes only had three or four in it, and those are still important, and those will continue to be important. We'll just have to find the appropriate space for them. Okay. And then, um, will there still be four magnet schools if all this is passed? Absolutely. So, yep. RCTCM will still be magnet, mm -hmm. AR Johnson will be magnet, separate? Yep. Separate schools? Well, and remember, because eventually RCTC will go into that Josie, the idea is to go in that Josie pathway, okay? Does that make sense? 
And so, yeah, but there will still be four. Those aren't going away. We're not getting rid of the choice and the, and the magnet. Those will remain. Um, it's the housing of how those remain is kind of the, what's up in the air right now. So there is a difference between choice and magnet, right? There is a difference between okay. choice. Like RCTC is right now is a choice. Uh, you do test, uh, and the magnet programs are the CT Walker, Air Johnson, and, and uh, Davidson. Davidson, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a lot in my head today. So those will never, right now, I don't say never because programs change over 50 years, but there is nothing in this plan that gets rid of magnet, magnet and choice. Okay? And thanks for that clarification. I want to keep saying it. They will always remain. Thank you. So I know that there's um, one card that's being written out right now, and they'd like us to read out their question. What I'd like to do at this time is if anybody else has a question that they'd like to ask that can be um, part of the uh, public record, that can be part of the recording, this would be one of those times to do it. If you would like us to read out your question to ensure that it's in the record and on the video, we, we are uh, opening that opportunity now. If not, what we also can do is um, <clears throat> this meeting has gone uh, a lot uh, differently than the other meetings. Uh, a lot of questions have been asked and they've been answered. Um, but we're also over only at the 715 mark. So one of the things we'd also like to do after we get to this question is we'll also stick around. Uh, Tracy and his folks will be here. Uh, the central office team will be here. The superintendent and his team are here. Um, if you feel more comfortable asking direct or specific questions without it being in this venue. But I do want to stress that if you want your comment or your question to be put on the record, both on the court reporter record and both on the film record, this would be one of those times to ask that question. And it looks like, do you, are you, okay, you can ask one right there and then I'll read yours after her. Hey. Hey there. Um, Jana Ingram. Hi, Janet. Sarai Ingram, Trinity Ingram. Hi, Saria. Hi, Trinity. Um, I saw on there, uh, I've asked a lot of questions. I saw on there that where you were looking, where you said that you were looking to close, where the, to, re, the, the original recommendation was to close three high schools. But then there's a recommendation in the proposal for 20, bond 25 to build a new high school on Fort Gordon, or I'm sorry, yeah. Fort Eisenhower. Yeah. Um, can you speak to that? Yeah, and absolutely. what's that about if we're closing yeah. one? Why now that's, that's a great question. So. Right now, the, the district has been working with the fort for a while about just access to a site on, their, on the fort, okay? Um, there's been a, a lot of talk in the past about building a high school on the west side. Now, first and foremost, if the land's available and then the district can work a deal to get the land, at least right now, it's a good idea to grab some land there. There's a lot of growth going out west and we know that. Um, there's no plan to build a high school because First and foremost, we don't have the enrollment for it yet. But to attain a piece of property that in the future we could build one is a good idea. Okay, and, so it's and, just a it property be, per purchase. Yeah, not, it's, it's not, yeah. The, and the district and the, and the fort are working together to minimize the cost impact to the district in, in a lot of good ways. The fort would encourage okay. us to do that. So let me just, and just really quickly. So right now, again, 8 to 12 years, I don't want to... In eight to 12 years, that piece of property either might not be offered to us or it's gonna be really, really expensive. So, and with the growth out there and some reshaping of the area, we, could, we might have an opportunity someday down the road to look at like West Side, Glen Hills, Bel Air area and a high school there and reshape the other schools around it. And so we want just flexibility there. That's the plan for that, but no plan to build a high school. Okay. Today's world, the new high school at that size would be about $150 million. And I know that sounds like a lot, but it's real. And so we don't have $150 million. Okay. And so, yeah, great question on that. Did you still want to ask your question? No question, <laughs> no question. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, so here's a question from the audience. If you are planning on moving kids to A.R. Johnson, how, mm -hmm. will they keep, how will they keep kids from destroying that building? Um, Read it one, I'm sorry. If you are planning on moving kids to A.R. Johnson, how will they keep kids from destroying that building? I, I'm not, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I mean, other than 
I mean, first of all, the building wouldn't be like out of control enrollment. I do know that. Um, that's based on operational management, behavior, security, a lot of those things that go into play in that. Um, I would hope, and again, we can, we can say all we want, but especially kids will be kids, and sometimes not ideal kids. I know that too. Um, but what I would hope is that we would have enough activity in the buildings and programs and of interest that students might find themselves more engaged in robotics or something than that other than, you know, dismantling the clock in robotics. Um, I, I can't answer that specifically because I know that happens a lot. Um, what I do know is that right now what becomes tough to manage is that we've, we even stretch our security so thin because we got so many. I, I was actually, again, I was in Tubman today and the security officer says I'm jumping between here and that school and that school and I'm trying to learn people. I mean even in the security, it's not that they're not looking for them. It's, it's hard to afford them and we're stretching them thin. So again, we're choosing to spend our money on the buildings instead of where the resources need to be. I think it's an excellent question. And so, and I think it's an appropriate question. And the uh, second question was also fundraisers were done for mm -hmm. the playground. Will that yeah. money be returned to parents? Yeah, that's, a, I mean, if you got room in your backyard. Um, no, I mean, when that stuff happens, obviously what happens is that playgrounds aren't set in stone and you can also move playgrounds and you can also reinvest into, program, into, into playgrounds to add to it when you go to another site. And so, for instance, if, and I continue to say if, there's a plan to move that over and it, or there's a recommendation to move it over, then there is, I mean, I, we, we talked a little bit about today, obviously a playground that they've already paid for to go over or reinvestment into that playground to make sure they have good or better or the same as better would happen. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, school and PTAs make those investments all the time that you have to pay attention to. And so, yeah, we're not, we're not gonna waste that. Um, the, the school district would honor that either in a move to help it move or if it moves and you need more, to reinvest into more. That's how you make a place better than they left. And so that wouldn't be, that, that wouldn't even be a, a, a topic that we would ignore. That's something we'd definitely do, top of the list. Oh, hey, sorry. Hi, Hi my name is Krishana. Hi, Krishana. Hi, uh, so my question for you is, um, so we're talking a lot about um, expectation with, around class sizes and mm -hmm. bringing more programs into the school. So my question is for teachers, for, mm -hmm. for the newer teachers or, yeah. you know, older ones are experiencing more burnout. So what is the incentive to keep them there if they're going to be taking on more extracurricular activities, they're going to be taking on more students? Um, what, what does that plan look like? Okay. The idea is that the individual teacher wouldn't have to take on as many students. Okay. And again, part of it is that we can't afford the paras, we can't afford the, the coaching, the coaches that come in to help. Right. Um, Title I dollars only goes so much to get Title I dollars in the buildings to help too. And so ideally what could happen is that we would minimize that that burden that day-to-day -day burden because you could get the support staff in there because you have enough dollars coming in the building that's again i think it's a small rudder to get there but i think immediately because a school like like this school that will open mm -hmm. then this is what's and, and but this is you're gonna get me on a tangent here in a minute because i think it's a great question um this school immediately will have enough students to be a fully funded building full-time nurses media specialists paraprofessionals because it has enough students in it to get that but guess what starts to happen folks everybody else wants paraprofessionals media specialists art teachers that and so what starts to happen in a district and every district does it in order to maintain equitable programs they take the schools that are fully funded and they pull some of those dollars out to redistribute them to the schools that are underfunded and so it could get less programs because the other schools, and we can't close some schools to get them to fully funded. So the schools that get fully funded have to spend some of their money on their not school. So essentially what they've done is they've cut down the fence so everybody can see over it, right? And the problem with that is, and you've heard me say this a lot, is that you defeated the purpose of the fence. So if our schools can't get fully funded, a school like this one that can get fully funded, 
are going to have to sacrifice in order for those schools that we can't get to because we fight the fight of not being able to close some buildings to get that up. And so the domino impact of keeping so many buildings isn't just the impact on the community. It impacts every child in the district. It just does. So that's the right answer, and ultimately. But this school will open fully funded because it can be. It can get all, it's got enough, what we call full-time equivalency, you know what that means, mm -hmm. enough in the door to, to, to populate it with the staff that you need. Okay. I'm just hoping that we don't keep all these really, really, really small enrollments open for the sake of keeping really, really small schools open. So you have to take your programs out. And we'll do right by communities when we do that. We'll get them into fully funded buildings. We'll make improvements to the facilities they're going to. And that will help too. And I'm a big fan of the better the building, the more teachers want to be in it. I mean, good buildings teachers want to be in. You're going to work in a professional place, it better be professional. I agree. So, great question. Thank I think it's a great question. Thanks. Um, so, as I mentioned, we're going to stick around. One of the things that I did want you to take notice, if you want to take a picture of this and put it on your phones, share it with folks, because we really want folks to be able to push the boundaries of exposure when it comes to this project. As you see, the upcoming meetings will be March 11th and March 12th. On March 19th, the board will vote on just the first portion of the, of the proposal that you saw here, which is for the 24-25 school year. If you would like to watch this meeting in its entirety or any of the previous meetings, you can go to Next Era EDU on YouTube. If you can't attend the remaining meetings, they will be live streamed on the county site. And before we close out, we definitely would like to thank the principal, the parents, the students of this, of this school, all the folks that made this meeting um, uh, possible tonight, the IT folks, um, the folks streaming, and uh, more importantly, again, you for being here. If you have any additional questions, staff will remain, but this portion of the public meeting will close now because there are no other questions. If, if oh. you want your address, come on up, and we'll get your address in here, too. We can Have do a good that evening. You Thank you. Thanks.